All right, welcome back for the last hour. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go back to slides. So we fully understood chemical burns and their basic management, thermal burns and their basic management, uh, sorry, electrical burns and their basic management and thermal burns, and the details on the management on thermal burns. So these are just the examples that you can read yourself. We don't need to touch them. Again, it's all the same that we discussed, so we don't need to worry about this. Okay. All right, now we're going to go to bites and stings. So it's on page 103 and case number 21. A six years old child tries to pet a domestic dog while the dog is eating and the child's hand is bitten by the dog. Now, you know, in the United States we have rabies. Rabies in dogs, coyotes, raccoons, bats. These are all animals that have been known to carry rabies. Now, a domestic dog is highly unlikely to have rabies. So if this dog has bitten the child, he's bitten the child because the child has probably interfered with his eating and that's a normal physiological response. You don't have to worry about this. Most of the domestic dogs or pets are vaccinated so they should be fine. During a hunting trip a young man is bitten on the leg by a coyote. The animal is captured and brought to the authorities alive. Now this behavior of the coyotes is unusual. Coyotes run away from humans. They don't come seeking trouble with the humans. This is an abnormal behavior. Hence, these, this coyote must be subjected to slaughter and take his brain out and look for the nagri bodies, which is the pathognomonic feature of rabies. If there are no nagri bodies, then the patient does not have rabies. But if there are, then the rabies has been implanted. How long does it take for a person who is bitten by a rabid animal to show signs and symptoms of rabies? A little bit depends on where the bite takes place. The further the bite is from the central nervous system, the longer the incubation period is. Because it takes the rabies virus to travel the peripheral nerves. They, they are the nerve virus. They travel the nerves and they go to the central nervous system. So it's millimeter by millimeter per day. So it's an ascending infection. That's right. So if the bite is on the neck or on the face, it's going to reach the brain much quicker than the bite in the toe or the leg. But no matter what, if you have rabies, you start giving them both active and passive immunization. So preformed antibodies against rabid virus must be injected plus vaccines must be given to protect, uh, to stimulate the intrinsic uh, immunological mechanism against the rabies. What if you are late, you're late and the patient has developed the symptoms of rabies? Can you then protect the person? No. Mortality is 100%. Absolutely. While exploring caves in the Texas hill country, a young man is bitten by the bats that promptly fly away. Again, a bat is a well-known carrier of rabies. And if you have a bat bite and you don't have the bat to examine, you're going to get both the active and passive immunization. During a hunting trip, a hunter is bitten in the leg by a snake. His companion, who is an expert outdoors man, reports that the snake had elliptical eyes, pits behind the nostrils, big fangs and rattles in the tail. The patient arrives at the hospital one hour after the bite took place. Physical examination shows two fang marks about two centimeters apart and there is no local pain, swelling or discoloration. What kind of a snake is this? Venomous or non-venomous? When you have elliptical eyes, when you have heat sensing pits, when you have rattles in the tails, these are uh, venomous snakes. But if you are bitten by a venomous snake, how many times would you get actual envenomation? 100%? 80%? 50-50. Yeah. Most, um, 
most demographic information is 80% will be venomous, envenomation. 20% will have no venom, even though the bite was from a venomous snake. You know, sadhus in India, they are famous for sucking the snake poison out and many people survive. How does that happen? Because the venom was never there in the first place. So it's a, you know, they make money out of uh, people's ignorance, <laughs> you know, the sadhus. So venomous snakes may not inject venom in 2 out of 10 cases. That's a fact. So this patient who has been bitten by a venomous snake arrives in the emergency room one hour later. Do you think he has envenomation or evidence of envenomation or not? Hmm? No, because the local signs of pain, swelling, discoloration are absent. So this guy is a lucky guy. He does not have envenomation because you don't see evidence of swelling and discoloration. You can reassure him and discharge him. During a hunting trip, a hunter is bitten in the leg by a snake. His companion, who is an expert outdoors man, reports that the snake had elliptical eyes, pits behind the nostrils, big fangs and rattles in the tail. The patient arrives at the hospital one hour later after the bite took place. Physical examination shows two fang marks about two centimeter apart as well as local edema and echemotic discoloration. The area is very painful and tender to palpation. Now what do you think? Is the venom in or venom out? Venom is in. And what's the treatment of envenomation? How do you treat this? Anti-venom. Anti-venom. What is it? What is anti-venom? Anti-venom is actually a polyvalent vaccine against the ven venom. So what you do is you inject um, is the polyvalent antibodies, immunoglobulins, against all the venomous snakes in North America. We took their venom and we injected it slowly to the horse. Horse created antibodies. We took those antibodies. It's a polyvalent immunoglobulins against multiple venoms found in North America. And those are the antivenoms that we use um, in, 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 uh, in the hospitals. Okay. Now, if you are out in the boonies, your closest hospital is about five hours away, and you've been bitten by the snack, snake, what's the best way, while the patient is being transported, what's the best way to deal with this condition to minimize envenomation? Number one is suck the venom straight away out and spit it away. Number two, incision and drainage of the venomous site. Number three, tourniquet. Number four, splinting. And number five is uh, um, observation um, in the jungle. Tourniquet. Tourniquet. That's old fashioned. Splinting is the way to go. No tourniquet is splinting. And you have to figure out, Timothy, why no tourniquet. Tell them why is there no tourniquet necessary. Or tourniquets are actually counterproductive. How does the splinting help, sir? The splinting basically, you immobilize the arm or the extremity. So the circulation is slow and gradual. So you're going to get small amount of a dose of venom that your body can handle it. But in tourniquet, what happens, the venom accumulates like a bolus. Sooner or later, you're going to take the tourniquet off, right? And then what happens is that bolus is waiting to rush into the circulation and that is more toxic to the body than a slow, gradual, uh, you know, dissipation of venom. So slow, gradual dissipation of venom with splinting is a more safer way to deal with the, with the envenomation than to tourniquet and allow. And of course, sucking and spitting is useless and um, of course, incision and drainage is also useless. So we're waiting to go to the hospital. Put the patient in a splint, immobilize the extremity. So the circulation in the extremity is minimum. All right. What is the number one cause of snake bites in the United States of America? Number one cause of snake bites in the United States of America? Anyone? Provocation, yes. When do you provoke a poisonous snake? When you are out camping, away from the eyes of the public, drinking Budweiser, that's when you provoke them. Okay, 
So the number one cause was actually drinking beer and provoking the animals in wilderness. Now when do you do that? When you go out with your friends right out up in the mountains where nobody is watching you and your true animal instincts and animal behavior comes out. <laughs> Budweiser. All right. Snakes like Budweiser. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know, buddy. <laughs> All right. While playing in the backyard of a South Texas home, a six-year-old girl is bitten by a rattlesnake. At the time of hospital admission, she has severe signs of envenomation. So, well, the point of this when you're just six-year-old small girl, but since she has systemic signs of envenomation, she will require large doses of antivenom. Antivenom is one of the few drugs where the doses is not, not based on the weight. It is based upon the degree of venom. So you can have a small girl with a lot of envenomation and a lot of antivenom and a tall, uh, big guy who has minimum signs of envenomation will require one or two vials. It all depends on the degree of envenomation. There's no perfect science behind it. During a picnic outing, a young girl inadvertently bumps into a beehive and is stung repeatedly by angry bees. She's seen 20 minutes later and found to be wheezing, hypotensive and madly scratching an urticarial rash. So this is anaphylactic reaction and you know when the bees are going to bite you, you're going to develop, the first response is going to be angioedema, swelling, wheezing, then hypertension, scratching and all that. What's the first thing you're going to do? You guys know it very well. Epinephrine followed by the other stuff. While rummaging around her attic, a lady is bitten by a spider that she describes as black with red hourglass mark in her belly. The patient has nausea and vomiting and severe generalized muscle cramps. What's the diagnosis? Black widow. Now the black widow spider, generally the female is larger in size than a male. She copulates with the male and then she kills him. And then she moves on. Why she kills him? We have no idea. But that doesn't mean our ladies out there are having ideas about things. The a black widow is supposed to be the most potent neurotoxin in the world more potent than even cobra. But since the spider is so small, the do lethal dose is almost impossible by a single bite. If black widows have to uh, kill a full, fully grown American man, there need to be five or six of them. But uh, a single bite will not kill you, although it is extremely poisonous. They will definitely get generalized muscle cramps. The antidote to black widow is calcium gluconate. Okay, so just remember that. This is a picture of Black Widow. Look at that. I had one outside uh, my kitchen door yesterday looking at it. It's, uh, it's an interesting thing. And this red hourglass mark that you see here, you see that red hourglass mark in the belly? Yeah, it's not that easily visible. You really have to fiddle with it and turn it around to be able to see it. It's the delicate part of her belly. That's where the red hourglass But this is a classic quintessential uh, black widow and it's a, it's a bigger spider than its male counterpart. Male counterpart will be less than half its size and she will kill him after population. I don't know why they do it. No idea. Okay, a patient, a patient seeks help for a very painful ulceration that he discovered in his forearm on arising this morning. Yesterday he spent several hours cleaning up the attic and he thinks he may have been bitten by a bug. The ulcer is about a centimeter with necrotic center and surrounding halo of erythema. Aha! What is brown recluse spider? Well, that is the one. I mean, this spy, all spiders don't like to be social. They live in, you know, quiet places. And brown recluse looks like this. Another common North American spider. And brown recluse spider can actually bite and the bite results in necrotic ulcer because the poison of the brown recluse is called dermatolysin. It basically causes necrosis of the skin of the dermis. And the pitfall about brown recluse bites is that if you're bitten by brown recluse and you come to the hospital in the first few days, the doctors are going to see a necrotic ulcer, excise it and suture the skin together because they'll say, oh, it's necrotic skin, you can't heal it. So they will excise it and stitch the skin back together. Guess what? The dermatolysin is deposited and it's still working. The ulcer is in evolution for up to the first week or 10 days. 
So when you see a brown recluse bite, do not make a definitive treatment on it right away. Wait. Wait and wait till two weeks have passed. Then you will have a stable wound to work on. Okay. Another condition that has come up that looks exactly like brown recluse bite, like a necrotic central ulcer, is what condition? Not Lyme. Mm -mm. It's a superbug infection called MRSA, methicillin resistant Staph aureus. Looks exactly like brown recluse. You will see a bite in a forearm or a leg or a thigh and it will have a central area of necrosis surrounding halo of erythema. Classical quintessential brown recluse type bite. Very painful. Methicillin resistant Staph aureus is a superbug acquired from hospitalizations or living in a communal setting like in a jail. The first outbreak was dated back to 19, late 1980s in LA County uh, Central Jail in Los Angeles downtown. Between the, um, you know, what do you call them? Inhabitants of the jail or prisoners or um, whatever you call them. There's a name they use here in America. Inmates, sorry, inmates. Thank you, Timothy. So it started off with inmates, so communal sharing and all that stuff. But now some of the inmates brought it to the hospital system. Now they are very rampant and very common, unfortunately. And once you have a superbug, you can't really eradicate it from your system. It may be controlled, you may suppress it, but it's always there. So brown recluse bite, excise it and drain and, and then close it after a week or 10 days have passed. If there is too much envenomation, there are systemic effects of brown recluse bite, then what drug can you use to suppress the systemic effects? Dapson. It's an anti-leprosy drug. All right. Let us end the trauma review with a classic. A 22-year-old gang leader comes to the emergency room with a small, one centimeter deep sharp cut over the knuckle of the right middle finger. He says he cut himself by a screw, with a screwdriver while fixing his car. Yeah, right, right. When do you get a cut on your knuckle while you're working on your car? You don't. So a cut on the knuckle is classically due to uh, hitting somebody and getting his incisors dug in your knuckle accidentally. So this is treated like a human bite. And the problem with human bites are that they are virulent organisms in our mouth like Streptococcus faecalis is a very virulent organism. It's a commensal of the mouth. It doesn't harm you when it's in the mouth. But boy, implant it into the long extensive tendons of the dorsum of the hand and you have a wildfire waiting to happen. So when these patients come to the emergency room with a, with a laceration in the knuckle, it's almost always a cover story. But the fact of the matter is, it is a result of a punch which get the, the, the incisors of its victim and the implanted microorganism is a very lethal one, is a very virulent one. So these patients need to go to the OR, they need to have a hand surgeon open up the wound, extensively lavage the wound, debride the wound and leave it open and then treat the patient with antibiotics and open wound care to prevent it from getting dorsal uh, wound ha hand infection. The entire dorsal uh, sheets, long extensive tendons, swell up and get infected, which is a rather ugly and dangerous situation. All right. So with that, we have finished trauma today, right? Wow, oh, wow. That's great. Now, where are we going? Why can't I proceed? Can we start off? Uh, because we have half an hour. Let me, um, let me start off with orthopedics. We take a five minutes here, stretch our legs. I'm going to fill up my glass. Come back and start with orthopedics. Go on for another 30 minutes, do some orthopedics. Hmm? Asma is saying we would like to do some questions for today, Dr. Faruqi, if you like. Thank you. Yes, yes, laugh out loud. Yup. I don't know. <laughs> so what kind of questions, Asma, do you have? You missed the morning session, my dear. So do you want to do some questions or you want to move on to orthopedics? We are on target. I mean, I'm on target. 
it's up to you in chest questions in chest because asma was late <laughs> all right if you have any questions in chest uh, shoot them for me and um, i'll address them can we go through all the compartment syndrome etiologies sure we can go through all the compartment etiologies let's get uh, because it's a very important topic so i want to cover it and let me just write it down again so compartment syndrome is a guaranteed multiple board questions and uh, repeatedly i have heard compartment syndrome asked so the four or five uh, we have about i think i have in our vignettes about seven vignettes seven different ways compartment syndrome shows up so let's take one at a time so the first scenario is going to be uh, compartment syndrome from renal from vascular injury vascular injury with reperfusion right that's number 1 number 2 is going to be number 2 is going to be Uh, no, yeah. Just the list. Vascular injury with reperfusion, crush injury is the number two cause. Crush injury. Number three cause is going to be uh, electrical burns, electrical burns of the extremity. Okay. Number four is going to be third degree circumferential burns. of the extremity number 4 is going to be um what was it crush injury vascular injury crush injury electrical bonds circumferential third degree bonds and da 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 you remember anything else that we have covered so far okay and um one of the i think we'll do this in orthopedics maybe later on um fracture long bone fractures fractures associated with with venous congestion venous injury so what happens when you have these uh, crushing injuries or when you have trauma to the long bones like tip hip fracture very commonly associated with hematoma within the compartment which leads to compartment syndrome so fractures of the long bones with soft tissue injury uh, leads to hematomas and compartment syndrome um then compression of the nerve compression of vessels overnight like a drunk sleeping overnight in a bench with his hang dangling down and waking up in the morning that's a board question that they used and they had this drunk who had drank a wine cheap wine bottle went to sleep over a bench in a public park overnight and he was sleeping for like 12 hours or more with his hang hand dangling over the bench like this and all through the night his uh, axillary artery was compressed and the forearm muscles were ischemic But when he woke up in the morning and removed the compression the reperfusion of the ischemic compartment resulting in the compartment syndrome that's also it so so far this is what we have covered uh roni that's not called saturday night palsy although the mechanism is the same but saturday night palsy is classically described for brachial plexus compression injury this is axillary artery compression okay all right Well, let's get going to the. Um, is any other questions you want me to address before we proceed? Not the radial brachial artery, um, axillary artery. Any other questions? No. Can we move on? Niraj is asking me something. Carol is asking me something. Um, okay, axillary artery compression. what is i am okay what is i am hmm? the main thing about if you um the main thing is if you have a vignette where the thought of compartment syndrome crosses your mind and the choice is fasciotomy choose fasciotomy 
don't get distracted by other injuries or by other factors don't get distracted by a good pulse don't get distracted by if you have thought about compartment syndrome in the vignette they're talking about pain out of proportion to physical findings severe um, you know sort of um, uh, tense compartment pulses are intact what do you do next and they will talk about several things which will make sense like they'll talk about diuretics they'll talk about mannitol they'll talk about close monitoring they'll talk about elevation of the extremity so that the edema and swelling goes down and they'll talk about fasciotomy you know what the safest answer for the board don't observe don't elevate don't dilly dally take the patient to OR and do a fasciotomy Within what time do we need to uh, administer antivenom as soon as possible? Uh, there's no, uh, the longer you delay it, the more the chances are that the, it will get into the bloodstream and cause systemic problems. Uh, the board really doesn't focus on timetables and exact, uh, you know, dosages. It's all management principles. So you don't have to worry about those details. Okay. Let's get to the orthopedic section now, maybe starting to do some uh, disorders of bones in children. Can we get that uh, slide here? Thank you. Okay, in the newborn nursery it is noted that a child has uneven gluteal folds. Physical examination of the hip reveals that one of them can be easily dislocated posteriorly with a jerk and a click and return to normal position with a snapping. The family is concerned because previous child had the same problem. What is congenital dislocation of the hip joint? Congenital dislocation of the hip joint is uh, a condition where, let me show you one thing first before we get to the pelvic harness. Uh -huh. Sorry, right here. So congenital dislocation of the hip joint is the result of the following because you need to understand the pathogenesis of the disease process this particular exam is going to test you out for pathogenesis so the head of the femur has fully developed as a circum as a ball and socket joint the ball is fully developed but the socket is relatively flat and it's easy for the joint uh, for the for the hip to dislocate in and out of this situation. So you have to develop the completeness. This part will come later, right? So that is why since this part is missing, this part is missing, the hip can slide in and out very easily. So the way to treat it is by public harness and that we were showing in the slide. Can we get the slide back Dr. Amanda, uh, Ms. Amanda or Dr. Amal? Thank you, my dears. Um, where can you get the assistance of two smart ladies at the same time? Kaplan, right? So if you look at this child, this is the public harness. So look at the position of the baby. It's the hips are abducted, separated, abducted, flexed, and externally rotated. Do you see that? That is a public harness. Okay, public harness allows for the maximum apposition of the head of the femur sitting in the socket of the acetabulum. This allows over six months for the rest of the missing parts of the socket to grow around the head and uh, complete the ball and socket variety. If you do not stabilize the hip in public harness, these children will grow up with a congenital recurrent dislocated hip um, and that's a problem. So it's basically dysplasia of the socket. The head is completely grown. A six years old boy has insidious development of limping with decreased hip motion. He complains occasionally of knee pain on that side. He walks into the office with an antalgic gait. Passive motion of the hip is guarded. So six years old with insidious onset. What's going on here? Again. What's really going on here is leg perthes disease. What is leg perthes disease? Well, in the first 10 years of life, in the first 10 years of life, what happens is 
that the head of the oh, sorry, sorry, the head of the femur just enlarges enormously and simply outstrips his own blood supply. There is a single end artery supplying the head of the femur and the growth or growth spurt in the first decade of life is so much that the most peripheral rim of the head of the femur simply outstrips its own blood supply and undergo necrosis and cause pain. That is called leg perthes disease. It's exuberant growth in the first decade of life. Got it? Leg perthes. Leg perthes. Not uncommon, leg perthes disease, not an uncommon entity. But you have to understand that the age is the key part, first decade of life. And these children, when you do um, their examination, they'll just have pain in the movement of the hip joint. And all you have to do is reassure the parents, symptomatic treatment, and the child grows out of it spontaneously. That's leg perthes disease. Moving on to the uh, subsequent slides. Okay, so now we change the age group from the first decade to the second decade of life. And this is really becoming a problem. Look at this, a 13-year-old obese, underline the word obese. A 13-year-old obese or chubby boy complains of pain in the groin, it could be the knee, and is noted by the family to be limping. He sits in the office with a sore side pointing towards the other foot. Physical examination is normal for the knee, but shows limited hip motion. As the hip is flexed, the leg goes inwards. So that classical presentation is really hip pain in the second decade of life in a chubby or obese child is nothing but what? It is slipped capital femoral epiphysis. Let's see if Dr. Amal has any. No, yeah, that's good. So slipped capital femoral epiphysis is nothing but the growing end of the bone just slips over. You know, this child is a 13-year-old. What is a normal physiological weight of a 13-year-old? Couldn't be huge, but in America, we have exceptions. In the United States of America, we have childhood obesity going on. I have seen a 10-year-old with 300 pounds weight. How about that child's hip? Don't you think that the, uh, she will have kip, slip capital femoral epiphysis sooner or later? Sure she will. There's an endemic going on here of this. Look at this. Uh, in, uh, inbox you see how the this is um, let me show you this is the epiphysis this is metaphysis this is growth plate so epiphysis is slipping over the metaphysis along with the growth plate that's called slipped capital femoral epiphysis the problem is if the epiphysis slips in a growing child he will have incongruent growth of that entire extremity and he also will have what what is the biggest danger of ignoring this entity and delaying the treatment? Avascular necrosis is the number one risk factor. If slip capital femoral epiphysis is left untreated, unreduced, the head of the femur will undergo necrosis because you know the end artery is not going to reach there and the head will die. So that is a true pediatric orthopedic emergency. And these patients need to be taken to OR and fixed with the pins. As you saw down below here, the treatment is pinning. Okay. So that is slip capital femoral epiphysis. A classical board question will come because nowadays we are seeing a lot of these kids coming in with slipped capital epiphysis. A little toddler has had the, had the flu for several days, but he was walking around fine until about two days ago. He now absolutely refuses to move one of his legs. He is in pain and holds the leg with hip flex in slight abduction and external rotation. And you cannot examine it. He will not let you move it. He has elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate. 
So in this age group, toddlers, the first two or three years of life, when you have a hip pain or a knee joint pain with elevated erythro sedimentation rate, what's the diagnosis? Os yeah, and it's not osteomyelitis, uh, it's uh, septic arthritis of the hip joint. Why do you get septic arthritis of the hip joint? Well, because it's uh, the ends of the long bone are highly vascular and all the bacteria that are in our circulation as children, as toddlers, usually upper respiratory tract infection, are filtered out in that area. And these toddlers are going to come with the hip pain and won't allow you to touch them. And uh, so what's the best way to manage the aseptic, uh, sorry, septic osteoarthritis of the hip joint in a toddler? It's bacterial infection. There's pus in the, in, the, in the hip joint. How would you treat it? Number one choice is MRI. Number two choice is percutaneous drainage. Number three choice is open osteoarthrotomy. Hmm? Drain it by open procedure. You take the baby or take the child to the operating room under general anesthesia. You open up the hip. You actually under fluoroscopy under general anesthesia, you put a needle into the hip joint of the child under fluoroscopy and aspirate. If the aspirate is purulent, you can then open the hip joint and wash it and lavage it and at the same time insert an indwelling catheter and give this child uh, six weeks of antibiotics. That's the treatment. So many people will say take the patient to MRI for diagnosis. Others will say take the patient to OR because a two-year-old toddler is not going to stay still in an MRI, right? You're going to have to give him general anesthesia there. Why waste time? Take the patient to OR under general anesthesia, aspirate the hip joint, you get the answer and you proceed. So the best answer for the board is OR, not MRI. Could it also be osteomyelitis? Yes, but that is uh, not in the hip joint. The pain will be in the bone. We'll talk about that momentarily. A child with a febrile illness but no history of trauma has persistent severe localized pain in a long bone, upper end of the tibia, lower end of the femur, that kind of place. So that is osteomyelitis. They will have fever, they will have uh, ESR elevation, leukocytosis, pain and tenderness without the history of trauma. So what is the best test to perform to diagnose a patient for osteomyelitis? What is the most commonly performed test is an MRI. What is the most, uh, what is the gold standard for diagnosing osteomyelitis? Is a bone biopsy. So obviously we don't do bone biopsy, but we do MRI. So children who are not still, who are, you know, difficult to control, they really need to be sedated to get an MRI. And the treatment for osteomyelitis is the same. You put an indwelling long intravenous catheter and six weeks of IV antibiotics are given. A two-year-old child is brought in by concerned parents because he has bow legs. A five-year-old child is brought in by concerned parents because he has knock knees. Bow legs and knock knees in this age group are normal. After three or four years, the bow legging is abnormal. And after seven or eight years, the knock knees are abnormal and those require surgical correction. But during this age, no problem. A 14-year-old boy says he has injured his knee while playing football, although there is no swelling of the knee joint, the complaints of persistent pain right over the tibial tubercle, which is aggravated by contraction of the quadriceps muscle. Physical exam shows localized tenderness right over the tibial tubercle. So in a second decade of life, an active athletic child develops pain in the, the patella ten, in tendon and patella of the knee joint. What's the diagnosis? Hmm? Osgochlater disease, yes. It's the, uh, let me show you what goes on here. Have you got a picture of osculated disease? No. Let me show you where it is. So, osculated disease basically is, you have the long quadriceps, you have the long quadriceps tendon that inserts over the patella. And this is the tibia, upper end of the tibia and tibial tuberosity is here. The tendon is attached here and part of your tibial tuberosity is cartilaginous. So what happens is when these children are active and playing soccer and kicking and using the knee quite aggressively, uh, what happens is that the cartilaginous part of the tibial tuberosity develops osteochondritis desiccans.
Osteochondritis desiccans is nothing but fracture of the cartilage, damage to the cartilage, peeling off of the cartilage from the underlying bone. And primarily the treatment is rest. Splint the knee joint, immobilize it for six weeks and the pain and misery goes away. Back to the slides please. Oscochlator disease, osteochondritis desiccans or the cartilaginous part of the tibial tubercle. Treatment, rest. Now, a baby boy is born with both feet turned inwards. Physical exam shows that there is plantar flexion of the ankle, inversion of the foot, adduction of the forefoot, internal rotation of the tibia. Don't try and remember them in individual, but look at the club foot. This is called Telepus equinovaris or club foot syndrome. The feet are turned inwards and this is how you look at them. Now, what's the treatment? The bilateral club foot syndrome is treated by molding the feet out one movement at a time. So first you turn their internal rotation to external rotation. Then you turn their plantar flexion to dorsiflexion. Then you turn other stuff and finally by the end of six months most of the babies should be fixed. We believe that 60% of the babies by six to eight months are fixed non-operatively by serial cast plaster cast applications and molding the feet back to normal. There will be 40% of the babies that will not correct and they must undergo surgery before they are expected to walk. So before the first year of life, before their first birthday, they should have the club foot syndrome corrected either non-operatively and those who fail op uh, non-operative management then surgical correction is required. Okay, a 12 year old girl is referred by the school nurse because of potential scoliosis. The thoracic spine is curved towards the right and when the girl bends forward, the hump is noted over her right thorax. The patient has not yet started to menstruate. Ooh, scoliosis is a really a problematic condition and it's preventable. So, scoliosis if left untreated is not only cosmetically disfiguring, but it also leads to the pulmonary hypoplasia, pulmonary hypertension and most of these individuals will develop core pulmonale and die as adults. So you can see in scoliosis the main problem is that one of the lungs will undergo hypoplasia and that's where the issues come from. So in the case where you have a young girl who hasn't achieved her menses yet, she still has immature skeleton. If you make her to wear braces, uh, or, or spine support, then she, that scoliosis can be corrected. But if the child presents to you after men sees, like 16 year old, by that time the skeletal maturity has already been achieved. In those cases, they need to do surgery and insert spinal rods. A four year old falls down the stairs and fractures his humerus. He's placed in a cast at a nearby dock in a box and he's seen by his regular pediatrician two days later. At that time, he seems to be doing fine, but AP and lateral X-rays show significant angulation of the broken bone. So in a young child who has a fracture of the femur or a fracture of the humerus and the alignment doesn't look perfect, don't have to worry about it. Because the child in this age group molds the bone so perfectly that it doesn't matter if there's not a perfect alignment, okay? An eight-year-old boy falls on his right hand with the arm extended and he breaks his elbow by hyperextension. X-ray shows supracondylar fracture of the humerus. The distal fragment is displaced posteriorly. Look at that. Now, when you see this, you will, you will reduce the fracture, put it in a cast and send the child home. Six weeks later, a child comes to see his pediatric orthopedic surgeon who removes the cast and notices that the child has this deformity. Look at me. He can't straighten his fingers. He cannot extend them. They're contracted like that. What do you call this, this particular thing? Walkman's contracture. Falling, falling on an outstretched stand under the age of 15. Patients who are under the age of 15 falling on an outstretched stand develop supracondylar fracture. Patients who are young adults between 25 to 35 falling on an outstretched stand 
develop scaphoid fracture. Patients who are over 65 females, osteoporotics falling on an outstretched hand will develop Coley's fracture. So supracondylar fracture of the humerus, number two, scaphoid fracture, number three, uh, Coley's fracture. Mechanism of injury same, three different age groups, three different, uh, three different fractures. Each fa fracture has a sexy thing about it. So the sexy thing about the supracondylar fracture is you can see the fracture and you can tell me what gets injured here easily. Hmm? Can you please repeat? Grace was sleeping. <laughs> okay. When you, there are three types of fractures that happen from a fall on an outstretched hand. If somebody pushes us, our natural way of falling is to fall on an outstretched hand in order to protect our face and our head. That's a natural mechanism. We fall on an outstretched hand. Which hand do we bring out to protect our face? Our dominant or non-dominant hand? Obviously the dominant hand, right? And if it is a dominant hand, imagine injury to the dominant extremities are important because they are your most useful extremity. So in a child who falls on an outstretched hand under the age of 12, he will develop this fracture, the supracondylar fracture of the humerus. The problem with this fracture is as follows. I think people did not connect the dots here, which is okay. I'm used to it. Supracondylar fracture of the humerus. The condyles have been displaced posteriorly and I am making a structure which is in front of the supracondylar fracture. This structure is dividing into two branches. What is this structure? Hmm? Brachial artery. Exactly. So you get a blunt trauma to the brachial artery with supracondylar fracture of the humerus and go back to the slide which was showing us the supracondylar fracture so they connect the dots now. Remember we talked about um, it's uh, kind of back and forth is not so you see that the brachial artery is going to be somewhere crossing in front here right so in the olden days the doctors would not appreciate the relationship between the brachial artery's injury to the to the to the bone you will have a blunt injury to the brachial artery and when you examine the pulses they'll be fine you send the boy home with a cast and after six to eight weeks the cast is removed guess what the brachial artery had thrombosed inside and nobody paid attention because the artery at the thrombosis takes time to evolve and that is the end result is you develop Walkman's contracture. Okay. For the same reason as the brachial artery, who's trying to do this? <laughs> Am I doing this or is it like the ghost? There's a ghost moving my green arrow. <laughs> okay. Somebody is trying to make the brachial artery here but failing miserably. <laughs> All right. So, Dr. Amal is trying. Okay, that's fine, Dr. Amal. So, the brachial artery is coming in front and it's really getting uh, damaged. And after blunt trauma, you don't realize the brachial artery remains where um, uh, thrombosed. And nobody knows about it. The child goes his merry way. He has a car arm in the cast for six weeks. After six weeks, there's ischemia, there's contraction, there's fibrosis. And that is why you develop Walkman's contracture, where the ischemic fibrosis of the compartment Flexor compartment leads to permanent disability of a 12-year-old boy, the future of your nation, unfortunately. And that is why the board is never going to let you pass the exam without knowing these pitfalls. You know, So when the days gone by, when kids were kids and they would play outside and push each other and be the kids that they were, they would have lots of these supracondylar fractures. And many of those supracondylar fractures, unfortunately, had occult brachial artery injuries and people, the physicians were forgetful or careless about those injuries and these children would eventually lose their forearm. Their dominant forearm muscles would be gone. You know, So the board doesn't ever want to. Nowadays, of course, the kids are not in the streets playing football or soccer. They are in their, uh, in their, in sitting in front of the computer playing video games, right? 
So those days are gone, but still supracondylar fracture of the humerus is important. Likewise, when you are talking about the supracondylar fracture of the humerus, you also talk about the adult, young adult, 35 year old secretary whose livelihood depends upon typing and using the wrist falls on an outstretched hand and she comes to the emergency room with pain and tenderness in the anatomical snuff box. X-ray is done and it shows nothing is wrong and you send the patient home. Three, four weeks later she comes back and she said, I've still got too much pain in my wrist joint. What is the problem? Asthma is right, scaphoid fracture. But scaphoid fracture, my dear asthma, we did the x-ray of the wrist, there was no fracture. What happened there? No, but I did not see the fracture. So is scaphoid fracture a radiological diagnosis or is it a diagnosis of clinical suspicion? It's a diagnosis of clinical suspicion. Unless the scaphoid fracture is displaced, you're not going to see in plain radiology. So a patient in the middle, in the young adult age group between 25 to 30, uh, between 25 and 40 years who falls on an outstretched hand, who presents to you with pain in the wrist and tenderness in the anatomical snuff box. You know the anatomical snuff box? When ancient kings used to put a white powder in the anatomical snuff box and sniff it. You know what I'm talking about. That's why the name anatomical snuff box. Right at the base of anatomical snuff box is your scaphoid bone. If you have tenderness in the bone after a fall in an outstretched hand, I don't care what the x-ray shows. If it is tender and you have fallen in an outstretched hand and you are in that age group, you will get a, 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 a splint to immobilize your thumb over your wrist. What is that splint called? There is a name for it. It's called a thumb spiker. Very good. And if you have a thumb spiker, then you have to wear it for six weeks. Because if you don't immobilize the, the thumb over your scaphoid, you will undergo avascular necrosis. And if you go under, undergo avascular necrosis, you need a bone transplant. If you need a bone transplant, the wrist is never going to be pliable and soft and supple ever again. And you are going to lose your ability to earn your livelihood. $55,000 a year secretary salary with benefits. She is 35, she, has an, she is 30, she has got another 35 years to live. The jury is going to make a simple calculation. 55,000 multiplied by 35 years equals to the amount. You pay him, pay her that amount or write off your rodeo drive mention to that secretary. Okay, So that is a pitfall. So you fall on an outstretched hand. As a child you get Walkman's contracture from supracondylar fracture of the humerus. You fall on an outstretched hand. As a young adult you get scaphoid fracture. The sexy part is that diagnosis of suspicion is a clinical diagnosis. Radiologically, you won't see it. You fall in an outstretched hand as an osteoporotic postmenopausal female, you will develop Coley's fracture, dinner fork deformity. And in that situation, what is the sexy point about Coley's fracture? It does not heal because of osteoporosis. It is common to go in after six months and fix the Coley's fracture. You're trying to fix it without surgery, not uncommon because of osteoporosis that the fixation doesn't work, then you go in and put plates and screws. So these three fractures, supracondylar fracture of the humerus, scaphoid fracture and Coley's fracture are constantly asked in the boards. Okay. All right. A child sustains a fracture of a long bone involving the epiphysis and the growth plate. The epiphysis and the growth plate are laterally displaced from the metaphysis, but they are in one piece, that is the fracture does not cross the epiphysis of the growth plate and does not involve the joint. In contrast, a child sustains a fracture of a long bone that extends through this joint, the epiphysis, the growth plate and a piece of metaphysis. Let's see if Dr. Amal has some pictures on this. No, she doesn't. I will supplement it, don't worry, because kids are confused about what is epiphysis, what is metaphysis, what is growth plate. I'll tell you what it is, don't worry about it. So, epiphysis, growth plate, metaphysis. This is epi, 
this is growth plate, this is metaphysis. Got it? So you see how the epiphysis and growth plate are together and they are slipped over the metaphysis, just like slipped capital femoral epiphysis, right? So this one is not a dangerous thing as long as it is the growth plate and epiphysis are together, you can push them back and fix them and they will heal fine. In contrast, the second case was like this. This is the, oh, sorry. And this is looking like this. The rest of the epiphysis and growth plate is separated out and moved away and got displaced in a different level. So this growth plate is sitting higher with its own epiphysis at a separate plane and with its own metaphysis. When you have a fracture that goes through the joint space, the growth plate and the metaphysis, this one is a beddy, this one is a goody. This one all you have to do is to push it back and reduce it. This one you need to go in and actually reduce it by open reduction internal fixation because the level of the growth plate has to be perfect. You need to be in perfect reduction. Any anatomical, anything less than anatomical reduction will lead to disaster in this case. So this case needs to be perfectly reduced anatomically with or whatever you want to do. Perfect reduction, perfect anatomical reduction. So the growth plates are at the same level. Epiphysis is at the same level and metaphysis is. So when the child is growing, he is not growing with a crooked surface. He is growing with a smooth surface. That's the point of this video. Let's go back. To the slides. And read again. Now you will understand it if you keep my figures in mind, right? A child sustains a fracture of a long bone involving the epiphysis and the growth plate. The epiphysis and growth plate are laterally displaced from metaphysis, but they are in one piece, that is the fracture does not cross the epiphysis or growth plate and does not involve the joint surface, right? In contrast, a child sustains a fracture of a long bone that extends through the joint, the epiphysis, the growth plate and a piece of metaphysis. Now you remember the two figures I made and this is how it described. This one is a goodie, this one is a baddie. This one can be reduced and maintained reduction with pins and screw. This one will require open reduction internal fixation for a perfect apposition. Okay. We'll stop here. Tomorrow we're going to start with case number 15, 16 about the bone tumors in children and then we're going to move forward. So tomorrow our plan is to finish orthopedics, finish perioperative care, orthopedics, back pain, foot pain, bone pain, pre and post operative care that will be covered too tomorrow and uh, we may be even starting part of the full gutter general surgery. So we are in good shape actually because when we come back next week we have four hours on Friday, right? and a full day of Sunday. So between Friday and Sunday the following week, we can cover your remaining general surgery and sub-specializations very easily. So tomorrow's stars cover the orthopedics, remaining orthopedics and perioperative care and portion of general surgery. I think I'll probably take you through um, first five or ten pages of general surgery as well before we call it a day tomorrow. Okay? So good night and good luck and enjoy your night and take it easy. Don't do anything I won't do and um, I'll see you bright and early tomorrow morning. Thank you. Monday too we have. Oh yeah, we have Monday as well, Monday afternoon. You're right. Okay guys, thank you.